I want to welcome you all for joining us on today's Dress and Drinks in our series Conversations on Dress. My name is Leon Weavers. Uh, thank you to all of you who come regularly. My apologies for the very sunlit background here, um, but here we are. Technology is our friend. Um, I'm a professor at Loyola Marymount University, and my area of background is costume design, and I also do research in traditional Korean dress. Uh, I'm really excited to invite to our webinar tonight um, uh, Alana Newman, the Petit Executive Director at the Warren County Historical Museum in Monmouth, Illinois. Before her current role, Alana worked as a Classics and Archaeology Adjunct Professor at Monmouth College. She is trained as a classical archaeologist with a BA in Classical Civilizations from Ohio University. After that, she went on to gain uh, both a master's in classical arch and art and archaeology and a PhD in classics from the University of Edinburgh, one of my favorite cities. Um, in addition to her love of ancient cultures, Alana has been drawn to fashion history as it's a chance to tell more uh, a more varied history. Noting that her background as an historian of the ancient world, Alana explains, you find that often history is told through the perspective of the majority and the people in power. Luckily, the Warren County History Museum holds artifacts that represent a large swath of people, which leads to diverse perspectives. And this is what Laura, uh, Alana loves about the Warren County History Museum's collection, and citing the textile exhibit uh, as a great example of women's voices. To see the stories that Alana is passionate about telling, uh, and she encourages people to, meet, to people to visit, Fashionistas Through the Decades, which is the current exhibition and explores the history of women's fashion in Warren County from 1860 to the present day. Um, okay, and with that, our drink for this evening is a delicious Goose Island, oops, let me turn and like, Goose Island IPA, must show the label, Goose Island IPA, um, a local beer of, uh, of the of the area, so we hope we are enjoying it. And the alcohol-free alternative is the Groovy IPA. So with that, let us welcome our colleague from Illinois as we enjoy a local brew. Alana, please join us. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna sip your IPA because this sounds really good. <laughs> Goose Island is fantastic. I cheated. I have a margarita again. <laughs> <laughs> all drinks are welcome at DD. All drinks are welcome. So, um, again, this is a shout out to Ann Was, who was like, We should do a beer. I was like, That's a great idea, Ann Was. So, Ann, who normally does our non our, our alcohol free version, or um, so she made this recommendation. So, and it's delicious. All right. So, Great. So, Alana, I'm super excited to see what you have to offer us tonight and to talk about the uh, the exhibitions. Awesome. Well, thank you. I'm so excited. So let's uh, let's get to it. Um, I just want to give a general overview of the things I'll be talking about today. So first, a little background on the Warren County History Museum, uh, shortened to WCHM because it is a mouthful. Um, I'll chat a little bit about the textile collection, including my favorite piece. And uh, then I'll go through the Fashionistas Through the Decades exhibit that is up now, um, specifically the process of creating the exhibit and some highlights from the exhibit. Uh, and then mention some of my final thoughts on the whole process. Um, so just a little bit of background, the Warren County History Museum was established in 1968 as the Warren County Historical Society. It opened its first museum in 1970 in Roseville, which is one of the villages in Warren County. I have a couple uh, maps on the screen. Here is Warren County in red. It's in Western Illinois. Um, and this is our wee county here. Um, with all the little townships, uh, I shouldn't say little, with the robust townships, um, with the main city being Monmouth, uh, where our museum now is. It moved there in 2009. Um, the, here's a picture of the museum. It's much bigger space. We used to be in a, a historic building, which was beautiful. It was an old high school from the turn of the century. Um, but as you can imagine, it wasn't the best for a museum collection, so they had to update to a better space um, in terms of environmental uh, reasons. Um, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. 
<laughs> it's important. Um, the artifacts are wide ranging, but they uh, the scope of the collection is Warren County, so made in Warren County, pertaining to inv uh, significant individuals in Warren County, clubs, businesses, uh, schools, things of that nature. And our artifacts are really broad. We have, as you might expect, a large number of um, agricultural equipment because this is um, the part of the Corn Belt. Um, there's also pottery, uh, Western Stonework, if any from the Midwest are familiar, was a big um, pottery corporation in the early 20th century. We have a number of textiles, which we'll talk about today, which is perhaps my favorite section. Uh, military items, school-related items, yearbooks, memorabilia, uh, local business items, and local groups, so rotary, sports clubs. We actually had our own baseball team called the Browns. So, oh, awesome. I mean, what's not to love about a yearbook? I mean, seriously, as a costume designer, a yearbook is a great thing for hair research. I just want to start I there. I love it. I actually have a photo of a yearbook in this presentation, so I'm excited about it. And, um, and I have to say, as a Californian in South Dakota, where I'm from, and I'm saying with my little sister, shout out to Connie Swenson, like the number of farm teaks. So I'm also super excited <laughs> about the farm teaks. Let me, let's oh just my talk. Gosh. Yes. That might be a little bit of shade, but we're going to go there. <laughs> oh, so many farm teeths. Um, but the textile collection is definitely, as I said, my favorite part. It is um, specifically in terms of chronology, about 1850s to today, although we have some gaps, as one might expect. Um, we include in our textile collection, it's a broad term, but quilts, bedding, needlework, but also clothing. Okay. Um, and our clothing items are baby and children's clothes, sport and active wear, underwear, we have a lot of petticoats and um, nightgowns, outerwear, jackets, gloves, shawls, we also include purses and hats in this. Um, we have minimal menswear beyond military uniforms, and uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And we have workwear, so we have um, some coal miners outfits and nurse outfit, things like that. Um, but it is predominantly women's clothing. I would say about 75%, that's an approximation, but about 75% is women's wear. Um, if I could hypothesize the amount of textiles, it's hard for me to say exactly because our records vary. Um, but I would say we have close to, by my count, a thousand items, maybe a little bit more. So it's a it's a big collection for a, a small local history museum. Nice. In, in terms of the space, we are very lucky that we have a large collections space. Um, we have three different rooms. We have our main collection space. We have a military collection space. And then we have a, a room dedicated to textiles with some textile adjacent being typewriters and um, high school newspapers from the 20s and 30s. Uh, but it is still nevertheless a great space. Uh, we can dedicate at least 80% of this to textiles, so that is quite nice. Um, the care of the textiles is an ongoing process. Um, there has been a lot of work so far to get the textiles into flat acid proof boxes. We recently got a grant to uh, purchase items to make better hanging textile storage um, so that Ooh, we can. The, uh, it was the Galesburg Community Fund. Yay! Hurrah! Thank you, Galesburg Community Fund. Yes, you Galesburg. know, there is a costume society grant as well for small collections. We did apply to that and we didn't get it. Reapply. We will. Don't worry. <laughs> because there's so much to be done, but it's exciting. Um, I, it's fun to sort of find what we need to help out and give some more love. So I do enjoy that. Um, so we're and definitely going to focus. Say, Alana, like we, you're talking about what so many collections grapple with in terms of their storage and what they're doing. However, I will want to say that like I'm loving the plaques in the background. It's like it's like we award you for your for your acid free boxes. Those are awesome. <laughs> I, I know that's not what they are, but that's where I'm going right now. <laughs> oh, maybe we'll put those sticky notes on the bottom to just say this yeah. is for your accomplishments in textile collection. Exactly, <laughs> totally. So you can just hide them over. Like if there's an animal head on it. As well that would be even better we don't have any animal heads we do have some birds but we could put them up there and they could guard it protect exactly. it from the mice. 
and the bats, which are also an ongoing problem. But the good news is that we are making a lot of effort towards it and it's just getting better and better. So um, awesome. that has been really fulfilling. Um, in terms of, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk more about some individual pieces. Uh, my favorite item in the collection is this 1960s dress with tags still on. Um, I found it and I just squealed with joy for a wee while. Um, you can see the tag on the side here and it's actually from a department store here in town or was a department store here in town. Um, it was sold at uh, E.B. Colwell's department store and you can see it was originally going for 30 but it went for five and I did calculate for inflation and so that would be about $49 for today. And I think that's pretty good yeah. for this that's really pretty good. Book. And yeah. that's the five dollars at forty nine. Yeah, that's pretty good for yeah. today. And that yeah. little cat line, you know, by Nadine Formals is pretty great. <laughs> it is, isn't it? I I love it. I love it when they have those little quotes. We have them in some of the tags on the labels, and I just think it's so fun. But awesome. yeah, we were I was really excited because you know it was such a secure connection to the local area. And I also got to learn more about how these were selling, the demand, things like that. I mean, as you can with one item, but um, it was still quite exciting. Uh, I thought I'd show you an image of the department store um, for E.B. Uh, Colwell's. This is from 1910. I, we unfortunately don't have any from around the 1960s, um, but it was a department store built in uh, 1904 in Monmouth, and it was the place to shop in Warren County, uh, as you may or may not imagine, but it was huge. They even had their own brands of uh, clothing, so women's wear and things of that nature. It was known as the Marshall Fields of Illinois, or of the West of Western Illinois, I should say, not just Illinois, because Chicago kind of predominates that. Um, but this was just such a fun find when my interns and I were going through the collection for um, determining items for the exhibit. We just we decided to just take a break and research all we could about the department store and and find out more about what would it have been like to buy this this dress. And we even had we just found out where in town it was, and it was just it was really fun. Does the building still exist? It does still exist. It's a, um, so part of it, it's broken up into different shops now. Um, one of them is a hunting sports type store. And another part of it is a B&B &B space that is just this massive B&B &B with multiple rooms. It has a rock climbing wall. It's very strange, but um, oh. they have like an event space too. Uh, uh, so it, it's been turned into a couple of different things. Hey, awesome, cool. Yeah, it's a really neat building. Um, so what you're saying so, is we can stay at the B and B, go rock climbing, yes. you know, go hunting, and see your museum all in the same trip. Exactly, it's a great place to stay. You should get like a whole group of people and come and visit, rock climb, drink, eat at Patton Block, you know, have a good old time in Western Illinois. <laughs> And while you're there, you can see the Fashionistas Through the Decades exhibit, which opened in. Uh, Oh my goodness, April of 2022. Uh, and I wanna just talk a little bit about the process for this exhibit. Um, mm -hmm. It was one of my first major exhibits as the executive director. The previous exhibit I did, which was a, quite a large exhibit was over COVID and it was a garden exhibit. And so I created a prairie garden. So you can imagine these are quite two different things, um, but it was an exciting change of play, uh, pace. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about preparation, the outreach I did with the exhibit, bringing the community in, some experimentation, and then some exhibit highlights. So um, our museum is wonderful. We have a great collection, but sometimes our records are a little spotty. Um, it just comes with the territory. So when I decided that I wanted to do this exhibit, which was actually I mentioned in my interview for the job, as I had worked with the previous director while I was a professor at Monmouth College. Um, he had given my students tours of the museum and I knew that they had this great textile collection. So when I got the job, I knew I immediately wanted to do something with that when I could have people come in and actually see things inside um, after the COVID times. Um, and I worked with my, stu uh, my two interns. Uh, you'll see Grace Pasaglia on the left here and Larissa Pothoven on the right. And we went through every item in the textile room and put sticky notes on boxes saying, 
maybe, maybe, Dr. Newman maybe wants this. So we had it color coded. Um, I drove them nuts because I couldn't say no to things. Um, and I don't have a lot of say, so it, it was tricky, but they were very helpful and they loved it. it. It entailed from, you know, taking things out of boxes a lot of the time and hanging them so we could see what they looked like because you, you can't really get a sense from a box. Um, right, right. And um, um, many, many collections these days, like we'll take the photo when they have the time to photograph things, they'll put the photos on the outside of the box to help them with that. But yeah. Yeah, that is one of the goals when we, we want to, I, I purchased those little like tags for the hanging storage so we can put a photo in and tag it to the cloth. You're infinite free time with your, in, with your large staff of 12 people. <laughs> uh, um, yes, <laughs> yes, 12, if only. Um, what, what, actually, so what is your staff? How many people do you have? One full time. Yep. Many, many clients <laughs> experience that. Uh, yeah. So we'll come, we'll come to talking about interns and volunteers in a little bit, but awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we have a part time uh, but person, but they're for rentals and events. So for collections, it's it's me. Um, uh, but what we discovered when we were going through these boxes is that I had to narrow down my concept because space was not going to allow for this grand idea of showing all the fashions in the world. Um, we also found, as I mentioned, there was not a, a lot of men's clothing and I didn't want to do a military exhibit. Um, we already have a civil war exhibit and I, I really wanted to do something different and something that maybe we don't often see um, at local museums in the Midwest, um, or at least in Illinois, they often tend to be focused on the civil war. Um, so I knew I didn't want to do that. Um, so focus on women. Um, we also saw noticed that there were a lot of wedding dresses, beautiful wedding dresses, but I decided out of respect for the owners that it was not going to be a wedding dress exhibit. That would be something separate. So I focused instead on um, everyday women's wear uh, that was not associated with major life, the major life events, more just like fashion came to be the subject. Yeah. Um, also going through it, we discovered that predominantly their 18th century items. So a lot of 1880s and then the other on the flip side was 1930s. So we had this big um, gap in time. Yeah, it was it was interesting. It was really interesting. So I had a, it was very hard for me to choose the the 1800s items. And then when I got to 1930s, I was like, I don't know, you're all so pretty. Um, but uh, we did, I did eventually figure out what I wanted, <laughs> so that was nice. So I managed to pick um, a clothing, so a, a, an outfit for each decade, for the most part, we'll get to that. Um, but also in coming up with the exhibit, I had, in terms of layout and what I wanted it to look like, I had this grand vision of a catalog. I wanted to make it look like a catalog. This awesome. is a great idea, in theory. Um, um, and I realized that I might not be able to do this all on my own. So I contacted a friend of mine at Monmouth College in the art department who teaches poster design. And she put me in touch with a student there, Natalie Takahashi. And we collaborated and created these ads. So here's Natalie Takahashi here at her senior art um, show at Monmouth College. You can see some of the ads behind her. Now, initially I wanted her to do ads for every decade. So what I found was we could do a decade from 1860 to what I thought would be 1970, but we'll get to that. Um, and that would be great. But then we realized this is a lot of work and she does only has so much time and we're both perfectionists. So we decided that we would only get to do 1930s to 1970s because for the other earlier ones, she would have to do illustrations and it just would take too long. Even though she was more than capable, um, we just thought it would be better for our sanity to narrow it down. So how this process worked um, was uh, I researched old ads uh, from the relevant decades. I also looked at catalogs and I came up with inspiration for Natalie. And then we worked with the Monmouth College costume department, they're from the theater department, and we got to borrow clothing um, and put our um, some students in these outfits and do photo shoots. So here's for the 1930s, that's my student, former student, Melissa, um, and she is modeling her 1930s. She really got into it. All of the models got into it. Um, 
they let they just came in and they were ready they embodied that time period i sent them in, information about their makeup and their hair so that they could come and and be as stylized the decade as possible i even showed them some things about poses um so it was a lot of fun and so here's the final outcome um for the 1930s um what we did do is we tried oh, I have a question. I'm super excited about this. This is super cool. So the clothes that the model is wearing came from the theater's costume stock. Yes, yeah, awesome. so the yeah. We've all been discussing the tragedy at the Met Gala and so I was like I want to be clear that these are not clothes in your collection going on yeah. a person that these are things out of the theater costume stock going on. Mm -hmm. They might actually be of that like vintage of that period oh, but they've been living sure. in the theater costume stop stock living many 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 different lives yes and when i think this was an original 30c so some of these are definitely 30s the uh director of the costume uh department would tell us when it was a recreation or when it wasn't um so they were like, oh, why can't we wear the ones in the museum? I'm like, no, we, we're not touching those. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, then, but then they understood um, once I explained it. So, yeah, it was just so much fun. Um, and so, for instance, for this one, what we wanted to do was we wanted to give it a touch of Warren County. So this I was really in, inspired by the Arc de Triomphe. And so I put in our Warren County clock tower here, courthouse. Um, and then E.B. Colwell is the department store that I mentioned. And so some of them, not all, tended to have a, um, we changed it a little bit to fit the uh, area that we're in. And I don't have them all up here. If you have time at the end, I can show you the rest of them. But this was 1930s. Um, and I just think Natalie did such a fantastic job. And a lot of uh, visitors, when they come, they actually think they're real ads, which whenever I tell Natalie, she's just, she's so chuffed and I'm so happy, so proud of her. Um, so these another- And what a great way to engage students in what you're doing. Like these are really sweet. That That's a great, lovely uh, collaboration between many different programs, as well as having the student and having the student have some portfolio work afterward. That's really yeah. sweet. Yeah, and she, it was great because it, for Natalie, she said it really influenced her whole year. She was taking a ceramics class. She was supposed to do a portrait or a portrait or a bust, I suppose. And she ended up doing a dress. <laughs> and so I, I like to think that was because of me. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it was just it was a great experience. And she I'm so proud of her and the, the students um, and what and it ended up being that this exhibit ended up having a lot of outreach with the community um and part of that was experimentation and a lot of these things sort of just were serendipitous really so one day i posted on facebook about this um you'll see this uh mccall pattern from the 1920s in from our collection and i said you know oh look at what i found today how cool and one of our community members messaged you want to make it? And I said, well, yeah, I do. Um, and so that's what we did. <laughs> um, so there's me and um, a good friend of the museum and former board director, uh, board director, sorry, board president, uh, Carol Parrish, uh, doing the whole process. She, she did it. I just modeled. I don't have sewing skills. I'm working on that. Um, but she put it all together. And this is the final product of me at um, the opening of our exhibit. And um, I will say that uh, having no experience with sewing, I did ask Carol who has m it's more experience than I do. She doesn't like to call herself a seamstress, but I think she did a really amazing job. Um, she said that she found some things that she wasn't expecting with the pattern. So there weren't a lot of uh, directions. Uh, there was a lot of assumptions that you knew what you're doing, which makes sense. Um, she said that uh, the seam was shorter, the seam line that they had about a four eighths of an inch shorter. Or uh, and, and we also noticed that the sizing is nowhere near similar. So this is a size 16. I didn't have any problems with that size. Um, so we just thought like, how, how much history are we learning right now by just making this dress? 
And so I included it in the exhibit. <laughs> and and um, I had a section about garment construction. So not just in terms of what Carol and I did, but we have a number of uh, garment constructing books from, um, we have a book from the 1860, not 1860s, I'm sorry, 1880s. Um, we have a number of patterns that I included in the exhibit from various decades, specifically in the early 20th century, um, so that people could get a sense of what it was like to have fashion back in, um, um, before fast fashion, as it were, and to be and to be doing this at home, yeah, <clears throat> and to be not in a fashion center like New York or Chicago, but to be in in a part of the country where you're getting these through McCall's patterns or mm. through books or through magazines or something of that nature. And so you're having to adapt and deal with that in that moment at, while you're at your own song machine. What a really yeah. cool thing. I think this is awesome. I love it. I love that you also got the chairman of your board or the president of the board, chairperson, to to make the to make this dress for you for the opening of the exhibit. That's awesome. Yeah, it was great. Well, she her she's not the board president anymore, but she was. So she she's all she's still very involved. She's fabulous. She did a great job. Um, but yeah, it was an amazing experience, and um, I learned a lot about this whole process. I learned a lot about fashion and clothes and garment construction, and it really helped me appreciate when I was putting the exhibit together how important it was to show you know these different patterns and these different books. Like I I just knew that I had to incorporate them, so. I got to, I felt like the context was so much better for the whole thing. Um, now, now for the exhibit, so some highlights. Um, as I mentioned, we go from decade to decade. Um, here are our two pieces from the 1860s. Uh, we have on the, I believe the left, if, I hope that's what you're seeing on the left. Um, it's the, dre the dress, the petticoat, which you unfortunately can't see here very well. It's about right there and the mittens were all worn by a Miss Warner at a garden party in Oak Park, Illinois, in honor of Abraham Lincoln. Um, so we, we love that little tidbit there. Um, this dress here, this striped dress, which I just love this velvet trim on the shoulders. I think it's so beautiful. Um, oh, wow. was, yeah. yeah, it's, I it, believe it's, I wanna say it's satin and velvet predominantly. Um, visitors, when they come and see this dress, they ask me if it was a dress for a child because the waist is very tiny. We measured it and it is um, about 20 inches. Um, and I and I told them actually, no, it was worn by this uh, woman named Jane Allen and she wore it into her 30s um, because we have documentation of it being a dress that she wore as an adult. Um, and they are just, they're just shocked. Um, and so I really enjoy their surprise there. Um, I will say that this, the garment here, this purple uh, uh, plaid one, I had to make the dress form for because it would not fit on any dress form, um, which was basically wood, a Hanes t-shirt, a lot of duct tape and newspaper. And then like one of those uh, dress form covers. And uh, so this was one of three that I had to make for our uh, petite ladies. Um, this was our, our 1870s to 1880s, we had a homemade bustle, which was really exciting that I could include that um, in the exhibit. Um, so you're actually going from right to left here because you turn a corner. So our 1870s was this brown uh, princess style bodice and skirt. It's made of silk and I just absolutely love the detail on this dress, this, um, this like subtle striping, the flower detail, these buttons, and then even the ruffle skirt. Say again. I said, oh yeah, I'm like, I'm loving the bodice. That's really great. And the dagging on the skirt with the pipe, is that piping or is that binding? I think it's piping. That's incredible. So. Like, that's really great. Like it's, it's, it's a wonderful sort of throwback to the middle ages. I mean, how often do you see that? That's great. <laughs> And it might not surprise you, I also, for both of these, I had to create dress forms for them because they were just too tiny. Um, I actually used, so I used a child's mannequin um, form as my base and put the shirt over it and wrapped it. And then even then I had to cut it through because I would fit it into the bodice to see if it would fit. And then I had to tailor it from there. So it was a process, but it was, it was a lot of fun. 
Um, and then our I love you talking about MacGyvering your mannequins. Yes. I do feel like MacGyver. It was great. I, I love that kind of problem solving. And there was a lot of that in this exhibit, which you might expect. And it was just, it was really fun. And it was great to get the interns in on it too, because they also enjoyed it. Um, they, they thought it was very strange at first, but then they got into it. Um, and then this green cotton uh, dress with bodice, I'm sorry, bodice and uh, and skirt with a satin ribbon detail and there's also lace around the collar. Uh, this is, I really love this dress. It was really hard for us to determine which way that skirt went. Um, mm. it was, the, the gathering is just so amazing and I'm sure we didn't even fill it out as much as we could have um, for the bustle there, but it was just, um, it, was, it was so cool to finally see it on a, shape that would have been appropriate we were kind of stunned because it's just in this box it goes it's flat in a box it goes like that it goes onto the uh, dress form and you're just like wow that's transformed um and then we had uh, 1890s and i this is the only section of the exhibit where i chose two outfits because I wanted to give the two different styles because of course in the Midwest we have a prairie style as you can see here with the calico and then we have this linen uh, jacket which shows the beautiful puff sleeves um, so I, I had to show both I just had to um, another thing I really like about this dress is you can see that it was mended uh, which is really exciting to me that you can see just like the wear and tear that would have gone on with these dresses and and that people would have used them. They're not going to, oh, I have a hole. I'm not going to throw it away. I'm going to I'm going to fix it and I'm going to continue to use it. And so mm -hmm. uh, I really like pointing that out to visitors when they come. So I have a question about the mending. Do you, was that salvaged from some other place in the garment? Like a seam somewhere do you know do you i mean because that looks like a pretty good size hole like uh, yeah so we didn't see any um mm. but i might have to look again i honestly hadn't thought of that but now i'm gonna go tomorrow and look all over that dress well because it might have also like the person who mended it might have had like a little scrap of the fabric left over yeah maybe so, interesting yeah yeah, that's a really, I, that's, I'm going to go look at that tomorrow. <laughs> um, so, I but I thought that was just homework today. <laughs> Yes, I like homework. I mean, why not? And then um, we go to the 1900s. So here we have a silk printed dress with this beautiful oh, bodice. Lovely. You can see the embroidery. And I love this floral geometric des design here also oh, wow. the just level of detail is so pretty on this dress um that i was so excited when i saw it, it gave me anne of green gables type vibes um and it was yeah it's just stunning um well, and then a very distinct asian vibe to it that little inset piece there there's something really cool about it. yeah hmm. Yeah, it's such an interesting pattern. Like if someone had, when we saw it, when I, my interns, when we found it, they were really surprised by the pattern because they thought the pattern was so modern. Like the, the geometric patterns here, they were quite surprised. And I was like, well, I mean, fashion is cyclical. So well spotted. Um, and then we have this uh, cotton summer tea dress. And, and what I really loved about this, this dress is that I could pair it with this photo that I found of these young women attending um, what was the Luther League in Monmouth. They're posing outside with their chaperone at Monmouth's First Lutheran Church, and they are the attendees of this convention associated with the Lutheran Church, all for young people to gather in a social way that is appropriate. Um, so I really loved the connection here. Um, and and a lot, and most of these um, items, I always try to pair with a photo so you could see a real, li a real life woman wearing the garment in addition to the actual outfit. Yeah. Um, so the 1920s were, is probably one of my favorites. Um, we have this beautiful flapper dress um, made of this, this silk um, under dress. And then I believe it's, I wanna say chiffon outer dress, but it has this beautiful beadwork. Um, and it was worn by a Mrs. Ethel Newman, no relation. It might be why I love it so much in addition to the color, but it's just such a stunning dress. I love the, the ribbon on the side. Um, 
And then we uh, have after it our 1930s um, dress. And I was really excited to include this vibrant print. Most of the items that we have are very, with, with some exceptions, um, their prints are fairly muted. And so I was really happy to provide this like crazy pop of color, um, especially next to the uh, what you'll see for 1940s, some sort of neutral tones. And again, my interns thought that this was a very modern fabric. They were very surprised um, at the fabric. And it wasn't something I initially thought, but that's why it's so nice to have, you know, the youths around. Cause exactly. it, it, and I love the shoulder, I don't know, what capelets? Yeah. Mm -hmm. kind of thing going on there that's really awesome that that blue that really pops that out that's yeah. really amazing um, are the sleeves underneath that are those uh gathered and puffed as well you they, know because it seems like they have a bit of a structure going on or something we puff them with paper but they are really i would imagine that it, they would have been quite vol voluminous because the i think the uh the shoulder here is a little bit tighter. So I do think they were meant to be a little bit more poofy, um, yeah. which is why we left it. And the beadwork on the on the on the twenties dress is really lovely. It's very simple, that little serpentine line, but it's really quite lovely. And I like the different uh shapes or the different lengths of the beads too. I think that adds even more texture to it, which I think mm -hmm. is really fun. It also has a little bit of an Egyptian feel, which is another reason why I like it. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, which which makes sense, of course, for for Egyptian media at the time. Um, and then here we have our 1940s and 1950s garments. Um, this beige one here is a K. Collier, um, who uh, specialized in junior wear out of, I believe, St. Louis. I loved the cutouts in this dress. Um, it was so different from any of the other. We had a, we had quite a few 1940s outfits, um, but I wanted something. Some, that you wouldn't necessarily automatically think of 1940s. Um, and so I really, really loved this one. But I also wanted, when I talked about the 1940s in the exhibit, is I also wanted to remember that we have two different things going on, right? We have high glamour, but we also have frugality because of the war. And so I included this really interesting book about making clothing from uh, sacks, flower, seed, sacks. So I thought that was a really juxtaposition of the types of fashion you get in this decade. Um, and I think people were really surprised when they're like, flower sex? Like, yeah, you know, you got to use what you have. <laughs> so, yeah, and, exactly, exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. So it was, and it was really cool to be able to show those two things. Um, and then for the 1950s, I struggled with the 1950s, um, because I was just as, as, a uh, Leon mentioned my background is in classics. So I learned so much about fashion history. Uh, this was a crash course. And so um, I was I wasn't I wasn't entirely sure about this one, but my but I but I know that um, and what I learned and what I wanted to convey with my uncertainty about this dress was that uh, fashion doesn't really restrict to one decade, right? And so I, next to this dress, I had these amazing photographs from this um, show that was put on in town. And this is a show from um, 1949. And it's a variety show put on at a, a local theater Rivoli by, um, uh, with, with some students and you, they included this bit where they had different fashion magazines and they did their covers. So here you have 17 and you have these lovely evening dresses. And so I thought that was a really interesting way to sort of sway into the 1950s. And the, they, except they had 17, they had Esquire, which I was really surprised by. Um, they had Vogue, of course, and Mademoiselle. Uh, so it was really fun to see these photos uh, and place them next to these different garments because I really just wanted to show with my limited space as many different types of styles as I could um, because there's just the silhouettes. We always think of like poodle skirts and things like that. And I touch on that, but there's also so much more to these decades um, that I wanted to show off. Um, and then, so we ended in the 1960s and 1970s for the exhibit. Um, now I was tempted to show off my favorite dress for the exhibit, but I didn't do that because the ad that we did 
was with, that, I, that I did with Natalie, which I can show a little bit later if we have time, um, was more mod. And so I wanted to go more Jackie O. And so this is why I chose this dress. It's a two piece. So you have a shift dress underneath and then there's this, this embroidered oh. top you put on. And um, the embroidery is just stunning. It's it's so beautiful. Um, I can look at it. Oh, lovely! Oh, no, that's really nice. It's it is so, and it's so well preserved. Like it's in such good state. Um, for the seventies, I couldn't actually find a piece that I thought or could research well enough to conclude that it was the 70s. And so what I did was in addition to the ad that we did for with Natalie, I included yearbook photos of students and, and I also included um, patterns from the 1970s. So here we have um, a yearbook from 1978 from Warren High School. And this is one of their dances and you can see their royalty from the, the prom here or fall court, I should say. Um, and these peasant dresses that they have are just stunning. Um, but as luck would have it, about a month after, uh, a friend of the museum donated a peasant dress to uh, our collection. And so now I feel like my world is complete. Uh, and it is just so lovely. Yes. So I was very excited. There's unfortunately no room to put it in the exhibit because I ended up using all the space that I could possibly inch out from it but it is there in spirit so that was really really exciting to be able to do that um we also did some accessories um we have hats gloves shoes i'm not going to talk about all of them i just wanted to point out a couple of the hats um on the on the left we have a pheasant um feather crescent cap and it belonged to one of our volunteers alice lawson um and her husband actually shot the pheasant the that yes. <laughs> so those so she i'm i'm i either she took them to someone who made the hat or i i didn't couldn't get the full story but i'll need to ask her because it slipped my mind but um i just love that she just used these you know they had pheasant for dinner so here's a beautiful hat um and then we have this lovely velvet uh hat wide brimmed hat with ostrich feathers um our collection we have a lot of hats i counted about 500 hats predominantly women's wow. hats and i just really wanted to give them space um but they take up a lot of space and so i i, I thought of a clever way around it I had Natalie, and so we decided to take still life shots of hats uh, that couldn't make it to the final heads on, in the display in the exhibit. And so we did some still life photographs. Uh, and I we while in the actual physical exhibit, I chose things based on if I could do as many different decades as possible. Here, I did it based on what colors looked good together because it was more of an artistic endeavor. Um, and just to give you a sense of what they looked like, here are two of the two of the three photos. Um, you can see that we have a uh, felt cap with veil here, a plate hat. Um, a velvet bonnet, and it actually does have fur trim, but it's falling away. Uh, we have this crescent cap and this straw hat with a velvet uh, ribbon. And interspersed are items and artifacts from the museum. So we have a Warren County history book here. This is a school bell from one of our one room schoolhouses that is no longer, but is in our collection. Um, and then of course we have uh, a lamp uh, and some old bottles here so it was a nice way to include warren county in the uh still life you could probably do just a hat exhibition <laughs> all by itself we did we just got a, a really like art deco shelving unit that goes in our events hall and my goal is to fill it with hats so that is on my list <laughs> um we also had some purses and these are my two favorite from the purse display the one on the left um i find a little bit scary um but i also really like it it has this wee face in it i think it's i want to say rabbit but i'm not sure about the fur um but it is a unique piece uh, and everyone is always startled they'll they look in the it's this is a sort of glass display case that you look up um, from the top and they're looking and you can kind of see that they're all of a sudden like, what am I seeing here? 
is it, it's a face. And so I, I like the element of surprise. And then on the right, we have a handmade shell purse that one of our members' grandmother made. And I thought it was just the just kitschest thing. I love it so much. It's so, so sweet. <laughs> no, They're both no. amazing. Okay, let me just say, one of my favorite kinds of purses in the world. So this is a new favorite purse for me. Um, <laughs> I love the alligator purses that have actually the claws on them. Oh. <laughs> head of the allig the baby alligator those are like i really need to start a collection of those because i really really love those um but the whatever this is rabbit purse this is a new favorite and, and yeah. it's also sort of odd that you have dead animals in both places <laughs> you know just because they're shells they're like they're so pretty they're shells that's true. I didn't think of that. No, you're right. I, but yeah, it's just, we have some others that are also very beautiful. Some uh, that have really beautiful embroidery and things like that. These, um, How heavy is that purse? How heavy is that shell purse? It's not that heavy. Um, I would maybe, it may be like three-ish pounds, but I don't trust the handle to hold but it. You know what? On a dark night at a at you know at a rumble, that purse will get you home. Yes, it is a handy purse. <laughs> purse. That purse will just be like bam, and you're out. <laughs> it is. It's kind of like brass knuckles, but in no, uh, totally, totally. I love it. <laughs> I'm not gonna mess with anybody with that purse because if you get hit with it, <laughs> you're out. <laughs> yeah, it would be pretty terrible. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I should like mention that. I'm not gonna... in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Everyone loves it when they see it. They're always they're they're always very startled by it, but they think, oh, how cool. And actually <laughs> I do think it was a trend in the region because I posted on it on Facebook when we first got it in and and a couple of people said, Oh, I had one of those, but and so I think it was just maybe a trend. Okay, is it decoupaged on? How are they like yeah. Is it like glued on and then it's shellacked over it? So it is this solid piece of shell? I think it's, I don't know if it's shellacked over. I think parts of it are. Some of them are definitely are, are definitely not as secure as they could be, but it's definitely like decoupaged-esque. So yeah, awesome. but it was, it's fun um, and also colorful. I like the pop of color. You know what, you know what, I have an idea. Like yes. you could do, you could do a shell purse workshop and like you could do, this could be a fundraiser, a shell purse fundraiser. That is a great, I will, I'm going to have to talk to my, my colleague about this. I like this idea a lot. That is, that is going in the books. <laughs> um, so at the end of the exhibit, we have a section with modern just that it, it, you end the exhibit at this spot here. We have these, these, this one photo actually, but we we took Natalie and I took a couple of photos with our models. Um, the one on the left is the one that you see when you at the end of the exhibit. So you kind of make this circle through the decades, and you end up here. And the goal with this photo was to show, you know, what we look, what we like to wear today, but also to encourage visitors to think about what things look familiar from what they've just seen. Um, and we the one on the right is actually my favorite one. We didn't include that, but this was uh, my note to the young ladies was to get it inspired by your characters. So you can see that they're trying to do their decades appropriate clothes, like posing, um, which I just loved in their modern outfits. And they're just doing full like Marlena Dietrich, Dietrich type of pose nice. here. Nice. It was, in the snow. It I know it was very cold that they they are they were such troopers. They were so excited though. Um and I think we were all just so enthusiastic that it didn't matter. <laughs> um which was nice because I did feel guilty. I bought them all coffees to make up for it, so I think that warmed them. Um but I just um so I just wanted to conclude a little bit with some of the things that I learned in this experience. Um I mentioned this was my second major exhibit. I had done some other smaller exhibits, but this was the bit, one of the bigger collection spaces. Um, and so I definitely learned how to problem solve with a space that maybe doesn't initially seem like it has enough space. 
for you to show everything you want. So I had to become creative with different depths, um, which is why I played with pictures and other types of artifacts to convey similar information. Um, it was really rewarding to, to, to figure out and problem solve for various things, um, especially with the uh, dress forms. Uh, we had some issues with um, uh, our part of the exhibit featured a textile wall that you could touch and so we had some issues getting that all aligned and figuring out the best way to secure this so that if people are going to be touching them they're not going to fall off so that was a lot of fun to problem solve um, and I also really respected the women who wore these clothes I mean you know we I'm out here outside in midwest heat it's like 100 degrees outside but yet there's these women who are wearing these dresses that have you know the whole kit and caboodle um and it's humid it's 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 crazy outside like i don't want to want to be outside in that so i really am grateful that i can and there's no air conditioning and there's no air oh my gosh and there's no air conditioning so i'm just really grateful that i can show my elbows and if i so choose um so i really appreciated that um and I really appreciated getting to show the transformation between um, the 1860s to the 70s and sort of the social and cultural movements that helped women be able to show more of their bodies and let, find less restrictions on how they dress, um, which I hope to, which I did my best to convey in a, um, diplomatic way, uh, and I, I hope that I conveyed that. Um, and I really liked being able to, um, as you mentioned in my intro, I liked being able to give a voice to these owners, even though sometimes we don't know the names of the women who wore them, we can at least relate to some extent their experiences with this physical artifact. And, and however small showing their dress that they once wore to uh, a young woman or a young man at Monmouth College who maybe hadn't thought about what it was like to dress in the summer in 1860 um, and appreciate changes that have happened, um, I found really meaningful. Um, so that was, I think, the most, uh, one of the most rewarding things um, in the whole process. So yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, thank you for letting me share this. Awesome, Alana, thank you so much. Okay, so we have a few questions. We have a few minutes left, so we're gonna take some questions from the audience. Um, the first question is, where do you get your interns from? Yes, so um, Monmouth College, I mentioned, is a, a liberal arts college. Well, I didn't mention it's a liberal arts college, but it's a liberal arts college in Monmouth, Illinois. I'm very lucky that I maintained really good relationships with my former students and uh, liked to, uh, politely boss them into coming to work with me if they missed me. Um, so guilt tripping them a little bit, but I'm being facetious. But in all honesty, I reach out a lot to the different departments. So for instance, with Natalie, I reached out to a friend and a colleague in the art department. Um, communication studies has sent interns. Um, so I pretty much just email them constantly. I get help from the different Greek life groups um, because they often need volunteer hours. So okay. they've been very helpful. Um, so yeah, that's how I mainly get my interns. Step into the theater department too. Oh yeah, well one of my students, Gabby, the, the middle student here, actually Gabby uh, is here and Grace are both theater majors, so. Hey, awesome. Um, okay, so the next question is, um the white tea dress that you showed did that stay white or did you do something to brighten it no it stayed white um oh, it wow. i awesome. don't know how i don't know how because yeah i was really surprised because we have plenty of dresses so the previous like i mentioned the previous um uh museum space it had a really big problem with water damage and humidity and the majority of our collection was in that space so the fa some of them did not fare well but that tea dress did um and there are definitely pieces that i've heard they had to unfortunately chuck because they were just ra just ravaged yeah awesome thank you so much okay. um so i think if you go back a couple of slides to 
in the picture overlay that you had. Um, do, do, do. How to make the dresses from a sack book. The illustrations are familiar. Um, it's, I forget the author, but it's called Tips for the Home Sewer or Seamstress is the title, I believe. And so finally, I'd like to thank once again, Alana. Thank you so much. Uh, from the Warren County Historical County Museum um, and all of the work that you've done tonight to share your collection with us and the work that you talked about. You are experiencing so many things that other people in the around the country are, so it's really great to share that. Um, thank you all for attending. Please follow Costume Society of America on Facebook and IG and make sure that you hear about our upcoming episodes on Conversations on Dress. Thank you again so much. Have a great night, everyone, and be safe. And we'll see you next month with a next episode of Dress and Drinks. Thank you so much. Thank you.